In the event of a force landing in an open swamp or occasional clearing, McCulloch managed to land upright in the swamp. He launched the dinghy that all pilots had fixed under the parachute on which one sat in the hurricane bucket seat, inflated it and paddled through the swamp until he came upon a canoe. He borrowed the canoe, leaving a ten guilder note pinned to a tree as payment. Eventually he reached a village where the natives were more than friendly. They regaled him with beer from a refrigerator that ran on paraffin and provided him with the biggest double bed he had ever seen, located in a hut decorated with old newspaper and magazine pictures. Rested and recovered from the beer, he was able to make contact with Palambang and arrange his own transportation back. Campbell White had a more harrowing experience. He was chased, just as I was to be a few days later, all over Sumatra at treetop height by a Navy aircraft, struck a tree, and ended up upside down in a swamp. Knocked out, he fortunately found that the hurricane did not catch fire. When he regained consciousness, everything was dark, and he assumed he was dead. Then, presumably on the Descartes' cogito, ergo sum principle, he decided he must be alive. With much difficulty, he managed to escape the cockpit. Eventually, a tribe of jungle natives appeared, and finding the scene comical, merely laughed at him. Communication was challenging without a shared language, but through sign language and a few Wilhelmina friends thrown in, he successfully negotiated with them, swapping the petrol in his tanks for transportation back to Palembang. However, he was very badly shaken and requested to be taken off flying, believing his nerves could not withstand any more of it. One would hardly have imagined a more unlikely suspect for psychological breakdown than Campbell White, who had a tremendous grin, an engaging laugh, and the happiest of dispositions. Fortunately, all ended well. He was flying again on the day the Japanese raided Colombo Harbour and survived the war. I recently heard that he is now a mining engineer in Johannesburg, the days between February 3rd and 14th were hectic, with the 14th proving to be the most dramatic of them all. One was either flying and involved, or not flying and watching the involvement of others. Much of the action was close to and within sight of the airfield, with a great deal of incident on the ground, including strafing and bombing raids, searches in the jungle for shot-down pilots, and so on. After this lapse of time, it is difficult to disentangle one day from another, but certain things stand out clearly in my mind. I remember seeing in the distance a Blenheim quietly flying along, apparently unaware that it was under attack. It reminded me of a childhood visit to the London Zoo's aquarium, where sticklebacks were fed by lowering a piece of cod on a string into the tank. For a moment, the sticklebacks seemed not to notice the cod dangling before their noses. But then, in a flash, they attacked it, burying their mouths deep into it. It was just like this with the Blenheim. At first it seemed not to be noticed by the Navy aircraft. Watching from the ground, there was nothing one could do to warn it, only hope. But just when it appeared the Blenheim might escape, it was spotted, and suddenly it was like that piece of cod, with a dozen or so Navy planes zooming and diving around it. Then it went down into the jungle. I also remember a bombed-up Blenheim in the middle of the airfield, on fire after one of the raids, which exploded. I suppose it was about a hundred yards away, certainly not much more, and the sight of that explosion is fixed in my mind like an image captured by a camera shutter. There was a huge ball of yellow flame, quite spherical, that engulfed the Blenheim at its centre, accompanied by a thud of pressure against my chest. The man standing beside me, near enough to touch, was struck in the stomach by a large piece of shrapnel, almost cutting him in half. One incident proved helpful later in Java. I had flown down with six or seven other pilots, ferried in a Lockheed Lodestar, to Kima Joran to fly hurricanes to the military airfield of Gillotin, and then ferry them up to P-1. This was on February 13th. There were eight of us led by Wing Commander Maguire. We orbited P-1 twice, and then broke up to land. Flying number two to Maguire, I was second down. As I taxied in, I saw other hurricanes taxiing out to take off, and realising something was amiss, I took a good look around. Suddenly the sky was alive with Navy aircraft that had appeared as if from nowhere. 
I have always believed the coincidence was too great for the Japanese to time their attack perfectly to catch reinforcements low on fuel, wheels and flaps down, coming in to land. They must have been forewarned by some fifth columnist about the eight hurricanes departing from Java, ready to ambush them. However, their timing was less than perfect, as seven of the eight hurricanes were already down. The only one they caught was Sergeant N.M., Scotty, Scott. He was well into his final approach, at perhaps 200 feet, already over the airfield perimeter, and about level with me, still taxiing in. I saw with horror a Navy aircraft on his tail, slim, jungle green, with its disproportionate radial engine, and cannon shells thudding from its gun. I saw smoke pour from Scotty's engine, and I could even see his head as he pulled back on his stick to gain altitude for a bailout. He did succeed, jumping from the aircraft at eight or nine hundred feet and landing by parachute safely near the airfield. What was more remarkable was what happened to the Navy aircraft. Its speed in the attack could not have been very great, three or four hundred miles an hour, perhaps. Even the recovery from the dive with more than a hundred and fifty feet of airspace in hand was not remarkably severe, yet it was more than the airframe could withstand. Both wings simply folded upwards, like the wings of carrier-borne aircraft that fold for stacking, and the Navy plane crashed beside us in the jungle dot. But perhaps the most memorable incident was that of Dickie Parr, one of the two 32 squadron pilots. He had been shot, and a bullet had jammed his throttle open. He made a remarkably efficient job of landing, switching off his engine and landing very fast with wheels up. This operation is usually much easier than it might be imagined. Typically, all that happens is that the radiator is torn off, the propeller shatters into small pieces, and the hurricane slides along on its belly until it stops. However, that is at the recommended landing speed, and Parr was probably travelling twice as fast. In his case, instead of sliding on its belly, the hurricane mounted on its nose and slid along that way, a most extraordinary and alarming sight. Had it toppled, that would probably have been the end of Parr. But it didn't. It went on sliding until it was conveniently far enough along the runway not to prevent takeoffs and landings, and there it stopped. Bertie Lambert and I tore out in a Bedford. Parr had climbed out of his machine and was waiting, watching us arrive. When we did, he put his right hand into his shirt pocket and handed something to us. I guess I won't be needing that any more, he said. It was his left hand little finger, taken off by the explosive bullet that jammed his throttle open. Insofar as this period is concerned, the history of 226 Group, while not entirely accurate, is interesting. At about 11 o'clock hours, the first attack was made on P-1 aerodrome by bombers and fighters. The warning given by the Observer Corps arrived only minutes before the enemy aircraft, so the Hurricanes were unable to gain height in time and were attacked in ones and twos immediately after taking off. There was still no reasonable RT communication. Due to these factors and the inexperience of the pilots, four Hurricanes were lost and only one Navy O-fighter, probably destroyed, with one or two possibly damaged. Subsequently, three of the pilots, one injured, returned. Author's note. This probably refers to McCulloch, White and Keedwell, respectively. The advance party of the ground reinforcements from 266 Wing arrived by air shortly before the raid, with information that the main party would be arriving by train in a few days, and with particulars of the force that had just arrived from England. As a result of this information, a signal was immediately dispatched to Bandueng that the air formation signals should be sent to Sumatra to assist in providing more and better landlines, both between existing aerodromes and headquarters, and also to the additional strips that were about to be commenced. There were no satellite facilities at Palembang. At the same time, a request was made that the equipment which had arrived from England should be dispatched at the very earliest moment, and that the loading of this equipment should be arranged so that the most pressing deficiencies, RT, WT and aircraft toolkits, could be offloaded first at Oosthaven and sent up immediately. The Japanese again raided P-1 with bombers and low-flying fighters, destroying a large number of aircraft on the ground. Once again, the warning came late, 
and once again the inexperienced pilots found the Japanese more than their match. There were several bomber aircraft at P-1, which Air Commodore Vincent had continually asked Air Commodore Hunter of 225 Group to remove, in view of the serious overcrowding of the aerodrome and lack of dispersal facilities. Air Commodore Hunter had undertaken to have all these aircraft removed by 8.30 hours, but they were still on P-1 at the time of the attack. It was due to the congestion caused by their presence that the number of aircraft damaged or destroyed on the ground was so high. Six Blenheims and three Hurricanes were totally burnt out, and approximately 11 more Hurricanes were damaged, along with one Buffalo and one Hudson that had just landed. In the air, three Hurricanes were shot down, two pilots returning later. One probable Navy O was claimed, with one or two damaged. Additionally, one Blenheim, which was just coming in to land at the time of the raid, was shot down, and the pilot was killed. In addition to the damage to the aircraft on the ground, a small number of dumps of petrol tins were destroyed, along with one petrol bowser, and superficial damage was done to the only building, the Civil Airport building, which was being used as restrooms for pilots and crews. Immediately after the raid, all personnel not otherwise engaged in servicing aircraft proceeded to clear away the debris on the aerodrome to prevent the Japanese from ascertaining the extent of the damage. Fortunately, the runways were practically undamaged and were, in fact, never out of action. One 3.7 and one Bofors battery had arrived. They were sighted at P-1 and P-2 aerodromes and at the oil refineries at Pladjo. These batteries were, however, without ammunition, as this had not arrived from Singapore. The final sighting of the guns was 8S.7S at P-1, 4 at P-2 and 4 at Pladjo. The Bofors were sighted six at P-1 and four each at P-2 and Pladjo. P-1 aerodrome was again raided, in accordance with the Japanese regular habit of three days in succession. On this occasion, the Observer Corps gave a longer period of warning, and our aircraft were able to climb to a sufficient height before the enemy aircraft arrived, allowing for interception. The raid was of very short duration and little damage was done. No definite casualties were caused to either side in the air. The OAS, Air Marshal Sir Richard Pierce, visited Palembang and was informed of the urgent need for more aircraft and the state of affairs regarding the lack of AA and aircraft ammunition, the lack of spares and equipment generally, and the fact that there was virtually no ground defence personnel for the protection of the aerodrome. He promised to hasten the dispatch of new hurricanes being erected in Java. Work proceeded with the digging of slit trenches and the hastening of dispersal pens, which had been commenced by the Dutch. Unserviceable aircraft were moved to the dispersal area, and ammunition and petrol were removed from them to lessen the risk of their being burnt out in the event of further air attacks. Group headquarters staff, together with ground personnel of 242, 258, and 605 squadrons and wing signals, all of 266 wing, arrived from Batavia and were addressed by Air Commodore Vincent. The general bearing and morale of all these troops were excellent and raised considerably that of the ground personnel who had come down from Malaya and Singapore. A number of these latter were failing to stand up to the bombing and aircraft were not being refuelled and rearmed during the raids. Air Vice Marshal Maltby, AOC West Group, arrived from Singapore and was informed of the general position and the lack of aircraft, experienced pilots and equipment. It was suggested to him that 605 squadrons should return to Batavia, pending the arrival of fresh aircraft, which were alleged to be on their way. However, he decided that the squadron should remain at Palembang. The AVM stated, with great reluctance, that he felt it necessary to remove all fighter aircraft from Singapore, and 232 squadron was recalled. Seven aircraft returned. Surplus maintenance personnel, besides continuing the digging of aerodrome defences, were given some of the unserviceable aircraft to break down for spares. Parties were sent into the jungle to attempt to salvage all possible spares from those crashed aircraft that could be found. At this time, the RT was functioning comparatively satisfactorily between aircraft and the operations room. Wing Commander H.G. Maguire, Wing Commander Flying, 
arrived from Batavia, together with seven hurricanes that had been assembled by personnel from 266 wing left there for that purpose. Dot P-1 was again attacked by bombers and fighters. However, due to improved control by the ops room and the fact that the RT was now working, along with sufficient warning received from the Observer Corps, a satisfactory interception was made and only one enemy bomber got through. Three Navy Zero fighters and two Army 97 bombers were shot down for the loss of one hurricane and its pilot. During these days, aircraft were used to cover the evacuation through the Banker Straits, but serviceability remained low due to a lack of equipment and spares. Two sweeps were made on the 13th of February 42 to find and attack a number of enemy seaplanes that had been reported landing off the east coast of Banker Island. However, no aircraft were seen. I was fortunate that although I was often attacked by the Japanese, I managed to get through the whole ordeal with, as far as I know, only one bullet hole in any aircraft I flew. My luckiest day of all was February 14th, during which my experiences in flying training had a significant effect on my own affairs. After completing elementary flying training on Miles Magisters at Mayer, near Stoke-on-Trent, I was posted to No. 8 SFTS at Montrose in Scotland to train on Miles Masters, more advanced and much more suspect aircraft than the gentle Maggies. I had done just over 40 hours of flying, of which 20 were solo. Montrose lies midway between Dundee and Aberdeen in the county of Forfar, and the airfield is located north of the Montrose Basin, to the east of a narrow strip of level land running between the sea and the Grampian Mountains. Weather conditions here are often bad, and were particularly so during the bitter winter of 1940-41sts. Snow that fell in December remained for months, and for much of the time there was heavy cloud and mist. Even on cold, bright days, there was the ever-present risk of ha, that terrifying fog that can bewilderingly appear and blot out a clear blue sky in moments. One January day, having passed my solo test, and with a few hours of solo flying to my credit, I took off on some exercise, and climbing through a thin layer of cloud, found myself in a strange, absorbing world that would have made a painter's heart race. Below, the cloud I had just ascended from lay as a level sheet, out of which hills and islands of thicker cloud rose, while above, another sheet of cloud hovered. There were no colours beyond varying shades of grey. It was a world I had never imagined, cool, tranquil and fascinating. Between the two layers of cloud was a space about a thousand feet high, which seemed to stretch north and south as far as I could see, apart from the cloud hills and caverns. I flew around for a long time, enjoying the experience, exploring, making simple turns around the cloud islets, skating along the sea of grey below, or scraping the grey ceiling above. Then, emboldened, I decided to try flying in the cloud, intending to return soon to my comfortable world of grey. I climbed gingerly, and for a while the grey stayed the same, but then it began to darken, becoming wet and gloomy. Deciding it wasn't to my liking, I began to descend as cautiously as I had climbed back to my open space. But I couldn't find it. The cloud hadn't closed in that quickly. I suspect I had gone too far west or east. Fear set in, and I became clumsy, toppling my gyro compass so that now, apart from not knowing how to find my open space, I didn't even know which direction I was heading. In other areas, this might not have been too critical but here there was the danger of flying into the Grampians, whose peaks were certainly higher than I was. I decided the best course of action was to climb quickly and worry about what would happen next once I had the assurance that I wouldn't suddenly find a hillside looming ahead of me in the gloom. It was a frankly horrible and extraordinarily lonely sensation, with false instincts continually warning me that I was about to hit a mountain from one side or another. I kept my eyes glued to my instruments, but with each passing moment, I became more tempted to discredit them. It was one thing for the artificial horizon to assure me I was on a steady, even upward path, but every sense shrieked that I was climbing too fast, not enough, or turning. It was an altogether ghostly, unreal and unsettling experience. But I fought the temptation to rely on instinct and persevered, 
and by the time I reached 6,000 feet, I at least knew I wasn't going to hit anything. But it didn't solve the problem. All around was the dark, gloomy, impenetrable grey, and the rain made streaks across the windscreen with mist streaming past the wings. To descend again was unthinkable. If I had known which way was east, I could have headed that way, out over the sea for perhaps half an hour, and then descended with impunity. But I hadn't the least idea which way was east, and I was quite sure, and I still think correctly, that to handle an aircraft in thick cloud and puzzle out a compass was beyond my powers. So I reasoned there was only one thing I could do, climb up above the cloud layer, set my gyro compass by the sun, and fly eastwards until I was quite sure the Grampians were well behind me. I went on climbing, and for a long time nothing happened except that I had continual moments of near panic. I found myself disbelieving the instruments more and more, overcorrecting, yawing, nearly stalling, becoming confused, imagining things in the murk and soaking in sweat. I became aware of an extraordinarily strong sensation that the world had been taken away altogether, leaving only this endless greyness and just me and the master tossing about in it. But when I was getting pretty near the end of my tether, the clouds suddenly began to lighten, proving the instruments were correct after all and giving me a lot of heart. I pulled myself together and continued climbing. Tantalisingly, the cloud lightened to this extent, and indeed continued to lighten but refused to break, while the rain turned to sleet and then to snow, and ice began to form on the windscreen. It formed a thin layer that was swept away by the slipstream only to promptly reform. This was followed by ice beginning to form on the wings, initially on their leading edges, then thickening and spreading as it was not swept away. By now I could see that I was nearly there, for the clouds were yellow, but under the combined effect of the fall-off in performance with height and the weight of the ice on the main plains, the master was becoming sluggish. The altimeter told me I was at 11,000 feet, which seemed a fantastic height, at least twice as high as I had ever flown before. I began to wonder what the master's ceiling was, even without ice on its wings, and at what height you started to need oxygen. At 12,000 feet, I finally broke cloud. It was a joyous feeling. Below me was that layer of cloud which today's air travellers know and take for granted, above which was the bright blue sky and the warming sun. I reset the gyro compass and headed east, with only the nagging thought of how much range I had, and the unpleasant awareness that I had to get down through all that again to bother me. Eventually, and very regretfully, I dipped into it, and soon found myself recollecting ice, and consequently losing height much more quickly than I sensibly should. All the old bogies returned, and quite soon I was flying as ham-fistedly as ever, toppling my gyro compass. Well, at least it was a quicker journey down, although hardly a happier one. I broke cloud at 200 feet to find myself over the cold, grey, wave-flecked North Sea. All would now be well if only I knew which way to head. Of course, it shouldn't have been a problem. There was a perfectly good compass in the cockpit. The trouble was that how to read it had gone clean out of my head, whether through the stress of the last hour or simply because I hadn't done my homework properly, I can't now remember. All that ran through my head was something that sounded like put black on black, or was it had on red, and steer on the lubber line. Or did you put the compass point on the lubber line? And what was the lubber line anyway? I divided my attention between steering a course between the cold grey clouds and the cold grey sea while glaring at the magnetic compass. I fiddled with it, turned it this way and that, and finally, without much confidence and relying far more on the fact that a north point pointed north, I steered what I hoped was west. Then there was nothing more to do but wait. It seemed a very long time flying at a hundred feet above the vast dispassion of the sea. I came across a freighter plunging in the murk, and wryly informed myself that it was a bloody silly way of travelling from one place to another when you couldn't stop and ask someone who knew the way but by then it was too late to change my mind, and I decided to press on with the rider that if I saw another ship before I saw the coast, I'd ditch. But then I saw the coast, turned south rather than north, hopefully, and, as it happened correctly, and landed in time for tea. 
What I learned from that experience was never to stray far from home when the ground was hidden by cloud and one was out of radio communication. That lesson stood me in good stead, Dot. The other thing to stand me in good stead was experience in low flying learned, illegally, at Montrose. Item 19 in the sequence of instructions for flying master aircraft is instrument flying. No one liked flying masters much, and instructors were not exceptional. Anyway, there is really nothing more dull than sitting in the back of an aeroplane while some fathead of a pupil in the front, with a hood like an Anderson air raid shelter, pulled over him, yawed and bucked you. So it was decreed that when pupils were deemed sufficiently advanced, the instructor's place could be taken by a second pupil, who was entered in the logbook as instrument flying safety pilot, a misconceived idea that quite failed to take into account rivalries and conceits. My safety pilot was a man like Campbell. He had red hair and nothing frightened him. If he had been at Palembang on February 4th, he would have had his revolver out as well. He was certainly not the kind of man to endure sitting for an hour like a bus conductor in the back of a master, with me fiddling about under the hood. Consequently, our mutual exercise of item 19 was usually limited to a bare ten minutes, after which we would head off somewhere to indulge ourselves in low flying. There was between us an unspoken contest. Whatever one did one day, the other bettered the next. You were, in effect, challenged to a duel. You needed more courage to refuse the duel than to accept it. The records of Montrose, no doubt extant, would show the result. Of every course that winter, about 10% were killed in flying accidents, the great majority of which fell under two headings, night flying and incipient spins while low flying. The master was not a forgiving aircraft. With the dihedral appearance of a Stuka, its incipient spins were vicious, and the margin between control and loss of control was very fine. An aircraft is kept up in the sky because the weight of air below its surfaces is heavier than that above, the slipstream from its engines, or the induced speed, as in jets, of its passage through the air, or where applicable, a combination of both, creates air flows above and below the wings designed for this effect. The maximum lift comes, of course, from the wings, which is why the less powerful the engine, the greater the wing surfaces must proportionately be. A rocket needs no wings. When aircraft turn, the effect of these wing surfaces is diminished, so that in a vertical turn their lifting capacity is nil. On the other hand, the rudder, whose primary function is to steer an aircraft laterally, can, when sloping upwards, generate increasing lift as the aircraft is turned on its side. When the aircraft reaches a vertical posture, lift is maximised. With a strong enough rudder and sufficient speed, or engine power, an aircraft could theoretically maintain a vertical position, although in practice this is not feasible. Nevertheless, it is remarkable how steep a turn an aircraft can execute while still maintaining controlled flight. When an aircraft loses its ability to stay airborne, it stalls. The nose rises, leading to a spin. The stall is gentlest in a straight and level flight attitude, but becomes most vicious when the supporting surfaces are reduced, compensated by an increase in speed and or engine power. Even in level flight, the master spin was harsh, jerky and unpleasant. Spins initiated from steep turns were sudden and deadly. However, it would be unfair to suggest that pilots had no warning. There exists a narrow margin between reasonable control and incipient spin, defined as violent juddering, which could be adjusted by the stick. Pulling back increases juddering, while pushing forward decreases it. If the judgment is incorrect and the stick is pulled back too far, or the engine is cut, the master flicks straight into a spin, which is manageable if there is sufficient altitude for recovery. However, below a few hundred feet, probably under a thousand feet, recovery becomes impossible, resulting in a crash that is almost certainly fatal. Low flying as a sport is not merely about hopping over hedges, which an absolute beginner can quickly achieve, it involves flying between, for instance, two trees, whose distance apart is less than the aircraft's wingspan, and at the last moment banking steeply to pass through. It also requires executing steep turns just feet above the ground. Particularly in a master, 
this is both wildly exciting and terrifying. The wingtip hovers just above the ground, while the world spins rapidly and the aircraft judders fiercely. The awareness that a misjudgment could lead to instantaneous death looms large. These were the games I played with Wilson, not out of desire, but from a lack of courage to refuse. It was daunting enough being the pilot. It was worse as a passenger, watching the ground whirl below, feeling the G-forces, and seeing the stick vibrate, making it almost irresistible to reach for it, as forests approached at 200 miles per hour with only a narrow gap to slip through. We got away with it, but not everyone did. There was a sequel. Early in January, another trainee pilot named Willis was assigned to do instrument flying with me. He was likely aware of the Kelly Wilson exploits, and may have felt the same pressure to conform. If he didn't participate, he might be deemed a coward. So, at his suggestion, we ventured to the low flying area after becoming bored with instrument flying. We'll just, Willis said, go off to the low flying area and do a beat up before we go back, shall we? He added casually, just one. I was far from enthusiastic, having endured enough of this with Wilson. I found it much more enjoyable to leisurely cruise the sky than to scare sheep and scrape cobwebs off trees. Besides, I was far more likely to return in time for lunch, Dot. But what can one do? Fine, I said, and off we went. Willis approached the task carefully. He found a suitable run consisting of a series of stone walls aligned parallel to our path and flew straight, low and true, lifting the master over every obstacle like a dignified steeplechaser. In the far distance was a wood. I thought that once Willis lifted the master over it, he might consider that enough excitement had been had, and we could return home. Then I wondered if he had even noticed the trees, and if I should draw his attention to them. But soon I realised it was too late. One moment all was blue, then green, then blue again. What shall we do? What shall we do? I heard Willis shout through the intercom dot honestly comma. I couldn't understand what the fuss was about. By the skin of our teeth, we had just skimmed over the top of a pine forest and were still apparently intact. Go back to lunch, I suggested. We've done our hour anyway. Look at the wings! Look at the wings! Willis shouted back, his voice tinged with panic. I'm... I looked at the wings and nearly jumped out of the cockpit in shock. There were great rents in the fabric, resembling a sheet that had been left to flap wildly in the wind and torn against barbed wire, with long streamers of fabric trailing from them. Can't hold it! Can't hold it! Willis cried. Glancing at the stick, I was astonished to see that, although we were flying straight and level, my stick, interconnected with Willis's, was hard over to the left. Hastily I grabbed it. In this precarious situation, with the holes in the starboard wing evidently larger than those in the port, we flew on, facing problems that multiplied with each passing moment. For example, it was clear we had knocked off the pitot head, which measures air pressure and thus speed, because the airspeed indicator was hanging limply. We likely had a glycol leak since the radiator temperature was steadily rising, and we could only turn clockwise by raising the stick to the normal straight and level position, while the airfield circuit was anti-clockwise. So we flew vaguely towards Montrose, clinging to the stick together and discussing our tactics. Willis suggested heading out to sea and bailing out, which struck me as a poor idea. Either we'd drown if we went too far, or the plane would crash on land if we didn't. In either case, I felt that for such an escapade one might end up shot. Thus, with no other imaginative suggestions and a dangerously high radiator temperature that brooked no delay, to the utter bewilderment of the station, we proceeded to make a circuit of Montrose Airfield, travelling contrary to all other trainers taking off and landing, like a man going the wrong way on a motorway. Oldest lamps flashed, very pistols fired, and masters passed by at close quarters in the opposite direction. Ignoring everything, we pushed down the nose, landed at guesswork speed, and far too fast, slammed on the brakes, ground looped one way and then the other, making a figure eight before, petrified and shaking, we clambered out. Our flight commander was a man named Wooldridge. He strode out from the dispersal hut, his long trench coat flapping against his legs, 
his peaked cap, softened by time and mess-kicking, low on his head, looking menacing. He inspected the master, glanced at us, then back at the master. He went around to the front, considered it for a moment, and then, reaching into the radiator, pulled out a fur cone. We were lucky. They couldn't touch me because I wasn't the captain of the aircraft, and when they brought a court-martial against Willis, their case was weak because I, their principal witness, had gone down with pneumonia and been transported to the Angus seat of Cortachi Castle. Willis was fined a mere one hundred pounds and restored to flying duties. More than anything else, these incidents prepared me for the stirring days of February 14th and 15th, 1942. On February 14th, the combined squadron strength at P-1 was 14 serviceable hurricanes, which, as has been stated previously, was the maximum I ever knew achieved. It is interesting to dwell for a moment on Churchill's comment in the fourth volume of his Second World War that our air force at Palembang, mainly Australian squadrons, consisted of about 60 bombers and about 50 hurricanes. The lack of reliable information getting out from these theatres of hostilities was perhaps only matched by the lack of reliable information getting in. A Japanese convoy had been sighted in the Banker Straits, a stretch of water between the large island of Banka and the east coast of Sumatra. 258 Squadron was detailed to escort a force of Blenheims to attack it. We waited, strapped in our aircraft, for the Blenheims to fly overhead, presumably from P-2, but they didn't come, and the decision was made to take off anyway. It was a splendid day, apart from some banks of cumulus through which we flew in a V formation, breaking cloud at about 7,000 feet, having seen just as we entered cloud and partially obscured by thin cloud below, the heartening sight of a large formation of Lockheed Hudsons heading in the direction of Palembang. Morale was unquestionably high, and there would have been a lot of cheerful chat going on, which I didn't hear because, in company with others, one of whom was Bertie Lambert, I either hadn't got a wireless set or the one I had wasn't functioning. We got to Banker and didn't sight the convoy, which seems odd now considering it was unquestionably there. In due course, Thompson decided to return to P-1. I had no idea what was going on and was rather surprised to find the formation turning southwards away from the airfield as we drew near it. Looking about and upwards, I discovered what I thought at first was the reason, a collection of Navy Zero S above us. Then, as the formation continued serenely on its new direction, I realised no one else had spotted them. The only thing I could do was to break formation, go to the head of it, and waggle my wings at Thompson, which I did. To this day I can see him looking at me, switching on his transmitter switch, barking at me, and gesticulating for me to get back into place. I pointed wildly upwards, but the penny didn't apparently drop. Something had to be done, even if I was the only one to do it. Fortunately, I wasn't. Bertie Lambert came as well. The next ten minutes or so were filled with incident. There weren't a large number of Navy Zero S, four or five perhaps, which is probably the reason why they concentrated on us rather than attacking the main force, now on ground instruction, on its way to P2. At all events, after a good deal of diving, climbing and turning, with all of us spraying the sky with bullets and cannon shells, I found myself, as Campbell White had a few days before, with one of them firmly on my tail. We were still at this stage a little thin on the ground as to the capabilities of the Navy Zero, but one thing we had learned was that it was more manoeuvrable than a hurricane, and also, at average heights at least, a trifle faster. The question of shaking it off in the normal way did not arise. The only thing to do was to get down low and quickly, after all, I had the Scotty incident in mind. If I pulled out sharply, if I was still there to pull out at all, the damn thing's wings might fall off. So down I went, using rudder more than aileron to skid, weaving as ragged a course as I could make it. One of the nine lives the war undoubtedly granted me was doled out then, because by the time I pulled out at treetop level, although the Navy Zero hadn't lost its wings and was still firmly on my tail, I, in turn, was still intact. From then on, I felt very much as I imagine a fox does when chased by hounds. There was no possible way of attacking the Navy Zero. If I had tried to climb or turn to attempt to do so, I should have been shot down at once. 
the only hope was in ignominious flight. Of course, it wasn't easy for the Japanese. One sees Bond films where single aircraft chase men round fields and finally machine-gun them to death, but to do that is nothing like as easy as it looks. The biggest difficulty lies in the fact that the body and wings of an aircraft impede the pilot's line of sight, except in high-wing monoplanes, which a Navy Zero wasn't. If you're flying behind a man in another aircraft, so long as he keeps going in the same direction, it's pretty easy, but when he turns, you have to turn as well, and you have to aim a little ahead of him, or your bullets pass behind. To aim a little ahead, you have to steepen your turn, whereupon he promptly vanishes from sight, putting you in danger of colliding with him. And if the chap is weaving in and out of trees, you have to be very careful or you end up hitting one of them. Even if you have the extra speed, you can't climb up above him for several reasons. Firstly, you lose flying speed, and he gets clear. Secondly, you lose sight of him. Thirdly, when you start diving down on him again, assuming you haven't lost him against the jungle, you have the same problem of deflection. In other words, you have to fire ahead of him so that he runs into your bullets, and when you point the aircraft to fire ahead, he disappears from view. Fourthly, you have to be very careful when you pull out of your dive, you don't hit the trees, because after pulling out to the straight and level attitude, your aircraft still goes on sinking downwards for quite a way. It really is much more difficult than you might imagine. So I wasn't the only one with problems, and I think I must have had the advantage of vastly superior experience in this sort of game. I make that assumption by reflecting on the attitude of Japanese air crews I saw subsequently as a prisoner of war, working on that same airfield of Kemajoran, where we had landed three months earlier with such high hopes. When a bomber landed, the crew got out and lined up on the tarmac, waiting for the captain to dismount. He then called them to attention. They saluted. He returned the salute and dismissed them. In other words, there was none of the casual relationship one found in RAF and presumably American Air Force crews. Equally, I am certain the Japanese training schools would have been based on rigid discipline, which would not have contemplated the possibility of the sort of high jinks of which Wilson and I were guilty. Nor do I think the Japanese mentality would tempt them to such excesses. They accepted discipline unquestioningly and stuck slavishly to the rules. I don't believe it is part of the training routine of any air force to have their trainees flying at trees less than a wingspan apart and turning to fly through them. It would be too wasteful on pilots and aircraft altogether. Anyway, although occasionally I saw Tracer making lines ahead of me, and whenever I looked in my mirror I could see this chap somewhere behind. Although in fact he chased me over Palembang itself, as I was informed by others of the squadron not flying that day when we met later in Batavia, he didn't manage to hit me. I just hung on to the principle of flying flat out, skidding with my rudder, and whenever I saw a couple of trees fairly close, turning between them. Why, I thought, who knows? I might bring him down that way. Well, perhaps I did, I don't know. One moment he was there, and the next I was using petrol and nervous energy to no purpose, because he wasn't. In pieces in the jungle, short of petrol, or just plain bored and homeward bound, he was gone. I felt much better and reviewed the situation. I wasn't quite sure where I was, and calculated I was probably nearer P2 than P1, and it was tempting to go there. But there was no good reason. I had no idea the rest of the squadron was already there. I had ample petrol still to make P1 and plenty of ammunition left. So I flew around until I spotted the town and made my way back to P1. I couldn't land at once because there were still one or two Navy O's about, of which I managed to shoot down one, and finally I got in. I landed on the runway and turning at the end where Pa's machine was still on its nose, although pushed a bit more to the side, taxied back to the south end of the airfield and brought my hurricane round in front of the terminal building in its usual place facing the east-west runway. I was rather surprised that no ground crew came running out to help me down, refuel the machine, recover the gun ports, reload the guns, and check the oil and glycol. I was also rather put out. I had, after all, quite a lot to shoot a line about. But there was no one. It was mysterious. I undid my straps, unclasped my parachute harness, hastily turned the gun button away from fire, and put my helmet over it, 
stripped off my gauntlets, hauled myself out of the cockpit, felt for and found the step in the fuselage, and jumped down to the ground. And still there was no one. I stood astonished, looking round the airfield, and there was no one. Nor was there any sound except the faint sound of an aircraft in the distance. I was never so mystified in my life. All but two hours before, I had taken off from a busy airfield. Now it was dead, deserted. Everything was exactly as I had left it. The unserviceable hurricanes, the petrol bowsers, the starter batteries, the odd bits and pieces, all the paraphernalia of an active fighter base remained. Everything except the men who used it. The airport building glinted in the sun, the chairs the pilots had sat in were empty. It was for all the world like something from Beaugest, the deserted fort with the tables laid, but only silence. I felt very alone, bewildered, standing there on this large aerodrome, wondering what it meant. I looked towards the only sound in that hot and empty place, Sergeant Pilot A, Bertie Lambert. The sound of another aircraft in the sky relieved my anxiety, as I saw it was another hurricane coming in to land. I watched it land running away from me, up to Pa's machine, turn and taxi back. It drew up beside my own, the propeller slowed and stopped, and the pilot, doing all the things that I had done, got out and joined me. It was Bertie Lambert. We talked in whispers, two sergeant pilots beside their hurricanes on a deserted airfield. What do you make of it? Haven't a clue. Where's the others? P2, I suppose. You didn't hear anything on your RT? L-I-S. So was mine. That was you came up with me? Yes. Do any good? Yes, I got one. You? Yes, a Navy O, and... A man came suddenly racing from the cover of the jungle shrouding the airfield's edge. Mickey Nash. What the hell are you doing landing here? Didn't you get the gen on your RT? Duff. I wondered if there were unexploded bombs. So was mine, said Bertie. What's up? Invasion by parachute and barge, Mickey said. You can't walk out. You can't drive out. They're all around the place. Hundreds of the buggers. You must have passed their aeroplanes. Lockheed Hudsons. One of us remembered the Lockheed Hudsons. But they were Lockheeds. I'm damn sure they were. You saw them. They were Lockheeds. Yes, definitely. And then the awfulness struck Bertie. Jesus Christ on a bicycle. We passed right over them. But they had British markings. I'm sure they did. I remembered the trailing flaps. They were Lockheeds, and they must have had British markings. We all saw them. You couldn't miss seeing them. There was a bit of cloud, but you saw them through it. You know what, said Bertie. The dirty buggers bought them from the Yanks. What a bloody sell. What a beano we could have had. You've got one now, said Mickey grimly. Listen. We listened, and from the cover of the jungle heard rifle fire. I forgot the Lockheeds. You're lucky, Mickey was saying enviously. You've got kites. If they start, said Bertie, Kawasaki Key 54S. Note astonishing resemblance to Lockheed Hudson's. In fact, these aircraft were probably Kawasaki Key 54S, which have trailing flaps and much resemble Lockheed Hudson's. And if I've got enough juice left... Mine's showing bugger all. Me too. Well, you'd better make your minds up quick. Mickey broke off. There was a thumping sound. Mortars, said Bertie solemnly. Hand grenades, said Mickey. I wasn't disposed to argue it. What are you going to do, I said. Get the hell out of sight before they start shooting at us. I didn't like the look of the green perimeter, but there was form to things. But Sax, if you aren't quick, you damn well won't start. Fair enough. Thank you, Mickey. OK, I said. Best of luck, Mickey. I'm going to need it. Best of luck. Ta, ta, said Bertie. I'm off. Best of luck, Mickey. We got into our aircraft hastily, all thumbs reaching for parachute straps and shoving the ends in the quick release, scrabbling for webbing harness. I didn't bother with gloves, but grabbed at my helmet and jammed it on my head with the loose ends dangling. Out of the corner of my eye, 
I saw Bertie's propeller begin to turn, and, taking a mental breath, pressed my own starter button, which is only used without the assistance of cranking or starter motor in times of dire emergency. Only when the engine is warm and the oil running freely is it likely to be effective, and if the engine doesn't catch quickly, the batteries soon run down. I watched the propeller slowly, jerkily, start to turn, and then there was a cough and the engine roared to life. I thumbed up to Bertie, whose engine had started too, then looked over my shoulder to wave to Mickey, but he had already vanished. I opened the throttle and turned left along the secondary runway to where it met the runway. Normally I'd have gone to the extreme south end of the north-south runway. Now I didn't bother. If there was the petrol, I'd get off all right. If the paratroops didn't interfere. I slewed the hurricane viciously to starboard so that I was pointing up the runway. Even now I did my drill. I was by nature a careful pilot. P. Petrol. That's a laugh. R. Retractable undercarriage. Lights red. OK. A. Airscrew. Fine pitch. OK. F. Flaps. Lever up. OK. T. Trim. Trim wheel neutral. OK. I took the most cursory of looks around the sky for waiting Japanese, then slammed the throttle open. The hurricane began to gather speed. The tail came up and the nose came down, allowing me to see the runway stretching ahead of me, with the mess of Dickie Parry's aircraft pushed off to one side and the jungle ahead. Halfway along, even less, I felt the hurricane unstick, and I turned at once to starboard, raising the undercarriage. The red light went out, and I felt the bump under my feet as the green light came on. Already I was halfway around my turn to P2, and looking down I could see odd parachutes here and there like handkerchiefs upon the trees. That was all. Just the parachutes and the green jungle of Sumatra, which hid the paratroops and nineteen-year-old Mickey Nash and God knows who else besides. At five hundred feet I levelled off. I'd have preferred being lower, but couldn't afford to lose my way flying too low over broken trees. Forty, fifty miles to P2. I looked at my petrol gauge, and it showed empty. I throttled back to just above stalling speed, and crept along above the trees, the aircraft wallowing uneasily. I didn't bother to look around for Japanese. Had there been any, I couldn't have done a thing about it. Twenty minutes later, I landed at P2, with Bertie following behind. When they checked my tank, I had two gallons left, and I suppose Bertie would have had much the same. We reported our claims, but no one was all that interested, and who could blame them? Ting McNamara had been shot down, and all manner of others were missing. Mickey Nash, Maguire and others, caught on the ground at P1. And, as well, the news was through that the Japanese convoy off Bunker Island had launched large numbers of self-propelled barges crammed with troops into the maze of rivers, which were the delta of the Moesi River, serving the town of Palembang. P.O. Ting McNamara, who died well after the war at home in Rhodesia as a result of injuries received at Palembang, was among other two fifty-eight pilots who hadn't been on readiness. Campbell and Harry Dobbin, Teddy Tremlett who'd joined us somewhere and was to be one of the five pilots killed on April 5th when the Japanese attacked Colombo Harbour. Others. All the pilots who hadn't been on readiness today. And yet another lot of kit gone west. The new lot I'd bought in Java to replace the lot I'd left behind in Singapore. Not that that mattered. But one thing did. My logbook. Left behind in that damned brothel they'd turned the women out of to provide billets for sergeants. Damn. That was a goner. That mattered. Meanwhile, in the jungle around P1, a small but fierce battle was going on. Nash, who had been duty aerodrome control pilot for invasion by parachute and barge, had been the one to report the paratroop drop to operations. A brief instruction had been issued which explained the sudden turning southwards of the balance of 258. Evit and Tiger Aircraft! Evit and Tiger Aircraft! Do not land at base! Land at alternative base. This instruction given, operations ordered all personnel to join with local Indonesian troops, anti-aircraft and other units to resist the paratroops. But there could be no organisation amongst such a motley group, whereas the Japanese were working to a pre-arranged plan with the knowledge that substantial reinforcements were already heading towards Palembang down the Moesi River. 
When it was all over, the tales from survivors were legion and often blood-curdling. Mickey Nash, trying to get through to Palembang with one or two others in a car, was ambushed. The road ahead was blocked, and as they slowed, realising what was about to happen, a hand grenade exploded at point-blank range, and Nash was badly injured. Somehow he managed to get out of the car and crawl, his mouth filled with blood, into a ditch. After a long wait, some Japanese came out of the jungle, and crouching down, Nash and the others, while unable to see them, could hear them jabbering a few feet away. It seemed likely only to be moments before they were discovered. They kept deathly still and silent despite the blood in Nash's mouth and chest. Then, at the sound of another car approaching, the Japanese withdrew into the jungle. One of the men with Nash signalled frantically to it, and the two men in it brought it to a screeching halt and, jumping out, hid themselves in the same ditch about eighty yards nearer the airfield. The Japanese reappeared, looked in the ditch, found them and shot them, one and then the other. Then they came back to the first ambushed car, still jabbering. Several times they went away and then returned, apparently finding this a convenient base. Discovery seemed so certain that Nash lay on his back in the ditch, mouth open, covered with his own blood, feigning death. Still, they were not discovered in spite of one of the Japanese jumping the ditch to explore the jungle beyond it. After a while, a third car came down the road. The Japanese held it up, and the driver jumped out, pleading for his life. He was murdered out of hand. Still later, more Japanese arrived in a captured armoured car, and the ambushed vehicle, being in their way, was shoved bodily to the side of the road, where it hovered over the ditch with its wheels only inches from Nash's face, but at least now hiding him. It was two hours before there was the sound of heavy rifle fire, and when this had died, a column of soldiers and RAF personnel came in sight, heading a convoy of all available lorries and cars making their way to Palembang. The Japanese withdrew into the jungle, allowing Nash and his companions to join the convoy, which, after continually fighting off rifle and machine gun fire and frequent ambushes with many casualties inflicted and received, finally fought through. Nash was taken to the hospital, where it was discovered that he had a piece of shrapnel lodged in his throat. After treatment, he was taken south to Java. He could speak, but his voice was barely audible and gave the impression of coming out through the visible hole in his throat. He was lucky to escape, yet it was only to be a respite. After a tremendous amount of flying in Ceylon and Burma, much of it in action, he was killed in a simple flying accident on December 19, 1943, in a collision while making a circuit of the airfield at Chittagong. Another strange tale was that of the group of 605 squadron ground staff ambushed in a lorry. Those not killed outright were ordered into a ditch and guarded by a single paratrooper, who stood across the road from them juggling a hand grenade. There was talk of catching it when he threw it like a cricket ball and throwing it back at him, which proved not to be necessary when, after an interminable time of anguish, an Indonesian suddenly strode out from the jungle firing from the hip. The Japanese fell. The soldier fired again, advanced. At every pace the soldier fired long after it was purposeless. But the strangest tale of all, surely, was that of Maguire. There are different accounts. The one I heard was that he stayed last of all with one other officer. They left P1 by car and were halted by a group commanded by a Japanese officer who spoke some English. Having informed Maguire he was his prisoner, he told him he must tell his men to surrender or they would all be killed. Maguire argued with disdain that far from being the prisoner of this pitiful little group, they would soon be his because he had two hundred fully armed men on the airfield. At this juncture, observing some of the paratroops advancing on both sides in a sort of pincer movement, he told the Japanese officer to order them back, which he did. The parley continued, and eventually, Maguire, seeming to weaken, agreed to go back and discuss it with his men. With the rider, he very much doubted if this would have any effect. You must persuade them, said the Japanese. It is best for them, or they will all be killed. Whereupon Maguire told the Japanese to wait for him where he was, got back into his car with the second officer, and, turning, drove back and passed the airfield for some fifty miles before they found another escape route. 
An alternative account is contained in Air Commodore Vincent's History of 226 Group and may well be more accurate, but personally I prefer my own version. Vincent wrote of February 14th, A large force of enemy aircraft appeared, and after lightly bombing the aerodrome, paratroops were dropped at two places around the aerodrome and at Pladjo, about four miles down the river where the refinery was situated. The number of paratroops dropped at Pladjo numbered approximately 300, those at P1350. At this time, all serviceable hurricanes were away, escorting the bombing force, which had proceeded to attack the enemy transports in the Banker Straits off the mouth of the... Immediately after the raid occurred, attempts were made to contact the fighters by radio, but without success due to the distance involved. Upon the return of the aircraft later, the pilots were warned of the situation, and the majority landed at P-2. Those landing at P-1 were refuelled and rearmed. After unsuccessfully attempting to locate the paratroops in the jungle, they proceeded to P-2. All available armed personnel were immediately rushed up to P-1 to engage the paratroops. Due to a shortage of small arms, many personnel at the aerodrome were unarmed, and throughout the day most of these were successfully evacuated through the paratroops to Palembang. At approximately 10.30 hours, instructions were received to evacuate Palembang, and steps were immediately taken for all personnel not engaged with the paratroops to proceed to P-2. This order was later cancelled and the troops returned. During the early part of the morning it was possible, despite sniping, to get through to the aerodrome, and some of the 3.7 and Beaufort's guns were successfully withdrawn, although several casualties were suffered. The rearguard for this withdrawal was provided by RAF ground personnel. Although some paratroops had been killed, by midday the remainder had consolidated and were holding the road about three quarters of a mile south of the aerodrome, just north of a roadblock formed by overturned lorries that had been ambushed on their way through from the aerodrome. Unsuccessful attempts were made throughout the day to reach P1 with reinforcements, food and water. Repeated but unavailing requests were made to the Dutch to force their way through with armoured cars. At about 1650, a company of native troops armed with mortars and machine guns arrived at the roadblock and began to advance along both sides of the road. However, they soon returned, and the officer commanding stated that it would be impossible to clear the road until daylight the following morning. At P1, after the rearguard for the AA had been provided and the unarmed men evacuated, the personnel consisted of the RAF defence sections of Nussel 242, 258 and 605 squadrons under their defence officer, a handful of native troops, and Wing Commander Maguire, a total of approximately 70 personnel. The paratroops were engaged throughout the day, inflicting substantial casualties. However, towards evening, Wing Commander Maguire decided that an attempt should be made by the party to fight its way through to Palembang, as it was impossible to defend the aerodrome at night with the small number of troops available. Ammunition was running short, the men were without food or water, and it seemed unlikely that reinforcements would appear. All unserviceable aircraft and fuel were destroyed, and the party set off, but immediately encountered a large force of paratroops. Following a parley in which each side called on the other to surrender, the party withdrew and decided to escape to the northwest. All troops were loaded onto two lorries and proceeded through the jungle towards the west, arriving at Benkulan after a week, from where the party was evacuated by sea to Java. It subsequently transpired that Flying Officer Taut, Defence Officer of 258 Squadron, was informed by a Dutch officer on February 13th that an attack by paratroops was expected on February 14th, and he was told where the paratroops would probably land. This information was never passed by the Dutch to RAF headquarters, and the first intimation of its existence was received when Flying Officer Tilt returned to Java with the remainder of the personnel who had been holding P-1. During the day, it was reported that enemy transports were unloading into barges and small ships at the mouth of the Moesi River, and that the force was proceeding up the river to Palembang. Bombers and fighters were dispatched throughout the day to attack this force. Towards evening on February 14th, 
the Dutch commander stated that the situation was well in hand and that all the paratroops at Pladjo were rapidly being rounded up. This wishful statement later proved to be false. On the 15th, Vincent wrote, At first light, a fresh attempt was made to reach P1, as it was not known that the personnel had left the previous night. The task was abandoned after it was found that the enemy was in full control of the road near the aerodrome and after the party had been fired upon. In the early hours of the 15th, the Dutch commander indicated that his troops could not hold Palembang, the large Japanese seaborne force was proceeding up the river quickly, and orders were issued to evacuate all personnel forthwith to P2 Aerodrome. This evacuation continued throughout the morning until midday, when almost all personnel, including the wounded, had been taken across the Palembang Ferry, the only exit to the railhead and the Oosthaven Road. At that time, information was received from the Dutch that the paratroops were advancing into the town, and the small amount of transport that had not been ferried over the river was destroyed, and the remaining personnel evacuated. During the morning, all stocks of petrol and rubber and utility installations were destroyed by the Dutch. Oil refineries and storage tanks had been ignited during the night. All secret papers, documents and maps were destroyed in Palembang, along with ops room equipment, but the IFF sets were successfully brought to Java. A large additional force of parachutists landed at P1 during the morning, quickly followed by troop carriers. Our bombers and fighters were used throughout the day to attack the river force, which had reached within a mile or two of the town by midday. Using the available motor transport and trains, all personnel were transported to P2, approximately 50 miles away. However, by early afternoon, it was apparent that P2 could not be held if attacked from the land, and orders were given for the evacuation of all personnel to Oosthaven, with a ground defence force covering the retreat. Bomber aircraft were ordered to proceed directly to Bandueng after their last sortie, and the fighters to Batavia. There was still a serious shortage of transport, and several Hudsons sent from Bandueng assisted in evacuating ground personnel. In addition, all available trains were utilised, with remaining personnel proceeding by road and some transport being used for leapfrogging those marching. Air Commodore Vincent proceeded through the night by road and arrived at Oosthaven early on the morning of the 16th to find petrol, rubber, etc., being destroyed by the Dutch and all troops being evacuated by sea. Lorries were sent back to pick up personnel marching down the road and those whose transport had broken down en route. An attempt was made to procure a train for this purpose, but without success. Rear guards were provided by RAF ground personnel, and all bridges were mined. All personnel arriving, including the wounded, were evacuated as ships became available. No RAF equipment could be taken, but P-1 airfield near Palembang saw the majority of action and casualties incurred by the squadron as a whole. In drawing the terminal building, the artist has allowed himself a little license. Evacuating across the Sunda Straits to Java, Nichols is on the left and McCulloch on the right. Between them is Lockwood of 232 Squadron. A few days later, a salvage force returned from Batavia to Oosthaven and salvaged some stores, the remainder being destroyed. The PMO Squadron leader, McCarthy and Squadron MOs, worked untiringly throughout the night and over a long and very difficult road journey, succeeding in evacuating safely some 35 to 40 wounded and sick. The rear guard withdrew in the early hours of February 17th, by which time all troops had been evacuated either to Batavia or Merak in Java. Immediately upon arrival in Batavia, all personnel were placed in barracks and schools. The aircraft continued to operate from Gillitan until withdrawn to Bandueng. It should be noted that there are certain discrepancies in the account above, such as those related to the rearming and refuelling of those landing at P1. However, a state of tremendous confusion reigned, and continually conflicting accounts were no doubt pouring in. As for the comment about Flying Officer Tote, I met him during the vain attempt of the remaining 258 pilots to get away from Java, and he never mentioned this, but by then, none of us were very occupied with what had happened three weeks earlier. As in the case of 258 Squadron, 
There is a gap in the operations record book for 232 Squadron for the period November 1941 to March 1942. However, this missing period has been partially filled in by a record written up by the squadron adjutant, Flight Lieutenant N. Welch, in India at the end of March 1942, with the assistance of Pilot Officer J.K. McKechnie and Sergeant Pilot H.T. Nichols. Part of the entry for February 14th reads, The personnel at the aerodrome, P1, were ordered to get back to the town, and it was during this that our casualties occurred. Flying Officer H.L. Wright organised a party in one lorry that was mounted with machine guns by the armourers. There were too many for one lorry, so some of the men climbed onto a petrol bowser which went on ahead of the lorry. A mile or so down the road they were ambushed, and the petrol bowser overturned, blocking the road and trapping and crushing an airman, AC-1 Kilpatrick. Another airman, AC-2 Duff, sustained a broken leg and probably a broken jaw. He was helped to the side of the road while the remainder of the party laboured to lift the bowser and rescue A.C. Kilpatrick. Having no tools or suitable timber, this proved difficult, and before it could be accomplished, the Japanese attacked in force. Flying Officer Wright was killed, and the rest had to take cover. Nothing more was seen of A.C. Duff. A.C. Kilpatrick was still alive, and subsequently, a corporal medical orderly crawled up under covering fire and injected a double dose of morphia, which probably killed him. Meanwhile, Flight Sergeant Smith and Sergeant Ratcliffe had been sent on ahead in an army service car used by the 3rd Battery Heavy AA. There were army personnel in the car as well, and this car was ambushed by the Japanese, killing all the occupants. AC Prez Day was one of a party of unarmed men making their way in single file along the road towards the town. The party was ambushed, he is believed to have lost his life, as nothing is known of him. Leading aircraftsman Thompson is a driver MT who was on duty at the aerodrome, and nothing has been heard of him since. Before finally taking leave of the Japanese paratroops, it may be interesting to read an official document headed Lessons Learned as a Result of Paratroop Attack on P-71 Palembang, Sumatra, 1. The first objective of paratroops is to cut communications. It is vital to have a WT point to somewhere outside, particularly when landlines are not buried and can be cut easily. 2. Paratroops are most vulnerable immediately after landing. It is essential that all armed personnel on the aerodrome be fully mobile to attack the enemy before they consolidate. Had transport been available at P1, much heavier casualties could have been inflicted on the enemy. 3. AA positions, particularly when outside the aerodrome perimeter, are particularly vulnerable and among the first objectives of paratroops. Adequate ground defence should be provided. 4. Armoured cars are essential, particularly for measures such as protecting road approaches and preventing the enemy from establishing roadblocks. 5. When the aerodrome is located in jungle or heavily wooded country, it is extremely difficult to locate where paratroops land and their position thereafter. Lookout positions in treetops should be arranged, with telephones to the main defence headquarters. 6. The most effective way of ascertaining the whereabouts and movements of paratroops in thickly wooded country is by low-air reconnaissance in slow-type aircraft, such as tiger moths, as the parachutes are often visible from the air. 7. The paratroops were armed with Tommy guns, machine guns, trench mortars and hand grenades. Aerodrome defence arms should include mortars to return fire over trees and AP light bombs for release from tiger moths on paratroop consolidations, as well as machine gun or mortar posts. 8. The Japanese paratroops at night gave vent to blood-curdling yells, serving three purposes. 1. Consolidation of scattered troops. 2. Unnerving opponents, and 3. Finding out where opposition was sighted, as gun and rifle flashes quickly revealed the positions of posts. It is recommended that the best reply to this is the throwing of hand grenades or the firing of mortars. 9. All pilots should be acquainted with a ground strip code so that their position can be signalled in the event of an attack while they are away from the aerodrome and in case WT or RT communication breaks down and or aircraft are not fitted with communication equipment.
Steps should be taken to ensure rapid destruction of all aircraft, equipment, etc., in the event of necessity for evacuation. For the destruction of aircraft, petrol tins or drums were placed underneath. Petrol cocks of aircraft were turned on and the engine overdoped. A car then proceeded along the line and a rifle with one round of DeWild ammunition was fired into the tins or drums. Transport should be available. Note, unserviceable aircraft should be emptied of all fuel and ammunition to lessen the risk of destruction by fire in the event of an air attack prior to any thoughts of self-destruction. Provisions on the aerodrome. Sufficient food, water and ammunition should be available on the aerodrome in case it is cut off, particularly where there is only one approach road. Armament for ground personnel. Where possible, arms should be available for all ground personnel, including hand grenades. An unarmed man is useless, and armed personnel who might be employed for offensive action need to be retained to protect unarmed personnel on the aerodrome. As a glance at the sketch map of P-1 makes clear, the paratroop drop was superbly planned by the Japanese, with one group close to the airfield and the other well positioned for cutting the road to Palembang. Additionally, although this was possibly due to the fact that suitable terrain for dropping troops is also good for sighting guns, both groups were very near both the 3.7 and Beaufort's batteries. Pilots who had reached P-2 on February 14th spent the night there, at the end of a lane some distance from the airfield, there was a hut of some sort, and we did the best we could in it, sleeping anywhere, on tables, in chairs, on the floor, ravaged by mosquitoes and disturbed by thunderstorms. In the morning, we were ordered to strafe the invasion barges now proceeding up the river Moesi towards the oil wells and the town. There were about eight hurricanes still serviceable, and it was arranged that 258 and 232 squadrons should take turns on them, with 258 making the first attack. Despite the time that has elapsed, that day is very clear in my memory, because it was remarkable, its incidents matched those of its predecessor. As mentioned earlier, P2 was a vast, sprawling jungle clearing, totally hemmed in by jungle, and so large that there were even clumps of trees growing in the middle of it, which formed no impediment. As we taxied out, I noticed the sky seemed oddly hazy, but neither I nor anyone else attached any significance to this. It was only when we were airborne, even before our wheels were up, that we realised the haze was a layer of mist, which, when broken at two or three hundred feet, stretched level, peaceful and white, over what could be judged to be the entire thousand miles of Sumatra. The airfield had simply disappeared. The American, Art Donahue, who was leading the strike force, was the only one to appreciate the danger sufficiently early to avoid it, immediately banging down his undercarriage lever and landing on his takeoff run. The problem for the rest of us was very serious. There was no method of talking us down, and there were no alternative airfields. One either had to land on P2 somehow, or make the immediate decision to fly south to Java, which was within range, potentially removing the entire and only strike force capable of attacking the invading Japanese. But P2 had quite vanished. It was down there, somewhere. But somewhere is not good enough when one has to descend through cloud whose base is barely above treetop height. In moments we would have been completely at sea as to even approximately where the airfield was. Fortunately, Donahue was equal to the moment. He hurriedly found a very pistol and a supply of cartridges, and advanced onto the field, firing upwards through the mist. Suddenly, a green ball shot through the cloud like a bursting Roman candle, leaving a trail of whitish smoke, and at once the hurricanes and a single blenheim, presumably intended to guide us to the barges, began to gyrate around it as a centre. It was a strange business, just the green balls bursting through now and then, and the angle of the sun providing an approximate idea of where P2 lay, and the rough direction of the landing run. Things soon became even stranger. One pilot, like an unenthusiastic swimmer on a winter's day, lowered his flaps and wheels and cautiously dropped the nose of his hurricane, only to momentarily disappear, almost at once rearing up in a fierce evasive climb, having obviously barely avoided colliding with the trees. He circled back into the group, Another pilot tried and either crashed or succeeded in landing, as he failed to reappear. 
Now, instead of seven hurricanes and a Blenheim, there were six hurricanes and a Blenheim. There is a blank spot in my mind about that Blenheim. I don't know if he got down on P2 or not. With his longer range, the problem would have been less pressing for the pilot. Being much more cumbersome than the Hurricanes, even with wheels and flaps down, it was hardly the type of aircraft to attempt what we were obliged to. Probably he headed off to Java. Anyway, he was gone soon, leaving just a circle of Hurricanes looking very unreal, creeping around with slowly spinning wheels and at times lowered flaps as well. I took my turn in an attempted descent and gingerly descended into the woolly depths. For a moment or two all was white, and then suddenly it was jungle green. I slammed the throttle open and reared up again like a startled rabbit into the clear air above. Again I tried and this time found the airfield, but instead of travelling along its length I was crossing it diagonally. I attempted at least half a dozen times but couldn't get it quite right. I was either overshooting, just at the edge, or heading straight for the trees in the middle. Meanwhile, the circle was diminishing in number, and I began to ask myself two questions. Would I now have enough petrol to make Kemajoran, and how many very flares did they have down there? Once they ran out, that would be the end of it. Possibly I would have given it up and headed off for Java, except for my experience in that flight in cloud at Montrose. If I had known the aerodrome was just below, nothing would have driven me away from it. So I persevered and steeled myself to think intelligently. The first thing, obviously, was to find out the directional bearing of the central axis of this strangely shaped jungle airfield. When I thought about it sensibly, that was not too difficult, and I didn't need wheels and flaps down to figure it out. I made a feint with them up, and it told me what I wanted. Now at least the problem was reduced to one of length and width, how to solve it. The field was very long and relatively narrow because it was wasted in the middle. The dispersal end was wider, and the opposite end broadened out considerably, giving P2 something of a keyhole shape. This offered a solution. Uneasily aware that only a couple more hurricanes besides me were still trying to get down, I waited for the next rising ball. When it came, I headed for it. Using the smoke it left as a marker point, I flew at right angles to what I figured the longitudinal axis of the airfield would be and started counting. I then turned a right angle, counted off the same number, and then made a third right angle, again counting. If I had it correctly, when I turned my fourth right angle, I ought to be heading more or less in the right direction for an approach, and I should have some rough idea how far away P2 was, Another ball at this juncture would have been very nice, but I didn't get it. So I set my course, counted off half my number, lowered wheels and flaps, and entered the mist. When I broke through, I was a little too much to the right, with trees below me and a bit too far along. But nothing was going to make me go up through that again. I side-slipped off height to the left, clearing myself from the trees, and put myself over the landing ground itself, too far along it to avoid running into the jungle at the end, but I believed I had enough room for manoeuvre. When the field began to open out at the keyhole end, I put on a little right bank to follow its perimeter. When I was as near the trees as I dared risk, I slammed the throttle fully open, brought the stick hard over to the left, and put the hurricane into a steep left-hand turn. I was very low, perhaps fifty feet, I had wheels and flaps down, and once into the turn, I couldn't see the trees I was obviously going to hit if the turn wasn't steep enough. On the other hand, I had a clear vision of the airfield in the direction I hoped to land. A knot of trees in the middle was an added problem, but the really important thing exercising my mind was how steep I dared make my turn without causing an incipient spin. I am satisfied that but for the practice I had with Wilson in Montrose, I would not have judged it correctly. As it was, I did. I got around the run, took off the bank, got straight, banked a bit again to avoid the knot of trees, and straightened up again. I was going very fast, but fortunately P2 was long. I fishtailed like mad, and it was all right. Pladjo and Songay Jerong oil refineries, Palembang, Sumatra, and Moesi River. The whole exercise had taken 40 minutes, and two of the precious eight hurricanes were firmly on their noses on P2. We were down to six. When the weather cleared, 
232 Squadron took off the remaining aircraft on the original intended mission. They returned about 90 minutes later without loss or damage, after encountering only light fire from the invasion craft. The Hurricanes were quickly refuelled and rearmed for 258. I flew too to Donahue. He made a prophetic remark. Know what I need? he said to me. Just a nick, just something that'll get me home to an American squadron now that we're in the war. He was to get his nick, not all that serious, just bad enough to have him sent home to England. He wasn't to get his American squadron, but he did get a British one. He was to be killed leading it. To deny them to the Japanese, the Dutch had fired the oil wells of Pladjo. I have read that the weather was bad when we set off on that strafing run, but it was not. Had the weather been bad, I could not have carried in my mind that clear and awe-inspiring picture of those oil wells on fire. The smoke from the refinery rose like a gigantic water spout, thick, black, oily, palpable. The smoke rose for several thousand feet before, catching some air current, it spread away like a signpost, a huge black swathe across the sky pointing to the target, and we flew under it as cover. It was a strange atmosphere, above the queer black cloud, below the darkened jungle, broken only by the turgid brown swathes of the many rivers which made the Moesi Delta. After flying for perhaps seventy or eighty miles, we came upon small craft making their way upstream, and attacks were made upon them. I found myself in a vertical dive, spraying bullets around a small boat, but then it occurred to me to wonder what right I had to assume this held Japanese, that for all I knew, it might be a boat packed with natives escaping the invaders. I packed it in. In any case, it was a futile exercise, sledgehammers cracking nuts. Twelve Brownings against a fishing boat. It wasn't what 232 had talked about. I kept close to Donahue, and he was puzzled too, looking this way and that. Then we came upon the barges. There was a string of them heading upstream, keeping close to the northern bank presumably searching for such cover as the currents and shallows allowed. They were large barges packed with men like sardines in a tin, and because at this point the river ran straight, they were in a long straight line. It is difficult to estimate how many men each barge contained, but probably it would have been two hundred. Their sole defence was a machine gunner mounted in each. I really can't remember if it was in the prow or stern, and the soldiers gave the impression of being so tightly packed they couldn't have raised their arms to fire at us. It was a remarkable sight. The barges, except for a thin white streak, like a tail in the rear of each stirring the brown of the river white, seemed motionless, and they made a curious spectacle. These oblongs of upturned faces dot, it was carnage. Each hurricane had a firepower of about 12,000 rounds a minute, with a total loading of about 4,000 rounds, and the guns were not loaded merely with normal bullets used by infantry, but with a leavening of what is used in air warfare, armour-piercing, tracer and incendiary. The target was, to all practical purposes, helpless. I probably saw the effect of Donahue's attack much better than any of my own, because I had fallen astern behind him, waiting my turn, with nothing to do and not much to think about but watch. The flicker of the defending gunners was like torches switched on and off, but no more than that. We had orbited to get straight in line and dived from perhaps a thousand feet. I really don't believe Donahue missed a barge. His guns raked the convoy from head to stern. The bullets made an unforgettable pattern. There was a pincushion of water ahead of the nearest barge, which moved along so that as the bullets raked through a barge, what one saw was the pinpoints of light in the barge itself, which would have been the tracers striking, and the pin cushioning carrying along both sides of the barges, then reappearing in between each barge, and so on along the line. It is impossible to conceive the horror and the slaughter wrought. Later, even the Japanese were to talk of it in awe. When we were taken prisoner, we took off and destroyed our brevets because we believed that had the Japanese in our camp known we were the pilots who had strafed them on the Moesi, they would have taken their revenge. Donahue made the single effective run because he got a bullet in his leg from one of the machine gunners. I saw him break away and head off back to P2. I stayed a little longer and was unharmed. 
By the time I landed at P2, Donoghue had already been taken off for treatment. There were many things about the war in the Dutch East Indies I never understood, but of them all, perhaps the most incomprehensible was the fact that we were not ordered to repeat the attacks on the barges. Two strafes had been made, and no hurricanes had been lost. There was, so far as I know, ample petrol and ammunition for six hurricanes at P2. The Japanese had been, we were sure, and as was afterward to be confirmed, brutally weakened, if not as yet stopped. It is not at all impossible that a couple more strikes would have stopped them in their tracks. A defeat, if only temporary in Sumatra, would have made the invasion of Java infinitely more difficult and perhaps put some spirit into the Dutch. But 258 at least, I can't answer for 232, made no more strikes. Instead, we were told to get away as best we could to Java. It really was extraordinary. There couldn't possibly have been a Japanese within 50 miles of P2, and in fact they didn't by that time even know of its existence. Before we were told to get away, we sat around, Lambert, Sheerin, Scott, me and a couple of others, watching rather gloomily an impressive oil fire somewhere near at hand. Presumably that would have been petrol storage tanks on fire. There was a terrible general atmosphere of depression and defeat, much the same as in Singapore, and yet in a way more tangible. One almost expected Japanese suddenly to rush us from the jungle. We ate tinned sausages and wondered what was going to happen next. We hadn't any hurricanes. Others had taken them. I don't know who. Then came the casual, weary order that we were on our own. We walked down the lane which led to the airfield, a rutted sort of track with low, thick bushes on either hand. We knew quite well there weren't any enemy miles away, but we still felt uneasy. The track came to a T-junction. To the left it led to the railway station and the road to Palembang, to the right to the airfield. We held a council of war. Which way to go? Bertie and I were for the airfield. There might be hurricanes which could be made serviceable. One would do for two pilots, one sitting in the other's lap. It had been done before. Sheerin and Scott were for the railway. These were the decisions made, and it was quite remarkable how our lives were changed. Sheeran and Scott made their way down to the southern tip of Sumatra and escaped by boat. They must have separated en route, for Sheeran got to Australia via Java, where after spending nine months with 22 Squadron, he was reposted as chief flying instructor of fighter pilots at some New South Wales station, while Scott boarded a ship at Oosthaven, whose captain was wise enough not to permit him to land when it docked, briefly, at Tanjion Priok near Batavia. His end was tragic. Like Mickey Nash, Scott was to fly continuously in Burma, often in action, rising to the rank of flying officer. On January 11, 1944, less than a month after Mickey Nash had been killed in a flying accident, he was to lose his life in the same sort of way. With another flying officer, he was detailed to escort a VIP from Chittagong to Ramu. While waiting, they decided to fill in their time practising cine gun attacks on each other. Scott completed his, and the other flying officer began his own, but accidentally pressing his gun button in error for his cine gun, he shot down Scott and killed him. On the airfield we found, to our glee and surprise, two hurricanes, one of which was none other than number 5,481, the one in which I had made all of my flights over the past two days. Now it was unserviceable, so perhaps 232 had made another strike, or perhaps another pilot getting away to Java had damaged it in a rut, taxiing out and changed to another. The problem seemed to be connected with the tailwheel. Can't fly that one, Sarge, a loyal ground staff grunted. Never get it off. How do you know? 